Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Lucy Gordon, Director in the Employment Team, and with me are Laura Oxley, Senior Associate, and Alice Ruffell, uh, Associate Solicitor at Walker Morris. We're going to be talking to you this afternoon about employee welfare and motivation in the new world of work um, as we move out of lockdown. Um, a couple of housekeeping points just to begin with. Everybody will be muted throughout the duration of the session, but hopefully we are going to have time for some questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, hopefully you should be able to see a question and answer function on the right hand side of your screen. So if you could use that, please, to submit any questions that you have throughout the session, we'll be pleased to answer as many of those as we can do at the, at the end. Um, we'll also have a number of polls throughout the session, so it'd be really great um, if you would be happy to um, be involved in those and participate and vote when asked to. So we're going to be looking at um, three main topics this afternoon. Firstly, Laura is going to be looking at new challenges around mental health. I'm then just going to have a quick run through um, of flexible working and diversity issues. And finally, Alice is going to be looking at how we can retain and motivate employees in our new working culture. We're going to address these issues through a series of case studies, and we're going to be looking at a firm of accountants for our case study. They're called LLA Accountants. Um, they have an office in Manchester. And before lockdown, before COVID, it was a fairly traditional working environment. So nine till 5.30 in the office, five days a week, with a very hierarchical reporting structure. So senior management um, supporting and supervising juniors um, in the team. So first of all, Laura is going to have a look at mental health in the workplace. Um, and that's a really topical issue with it being Mental Health Awareness Week, isn't it, Laura? Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, I think we've all been talking about mental health for, for some time now. Um, but one of the many effects of the pandemic is to bring it into sharp focus. Uh, Mind the mental health charity has reported that since the pandemic hit, more than half of UK adults and two thirds of young people had experienced a decline in their mental health. And one of the main reasons cited for this was workplace issues and stability of employment. So um, mental health is a big issue and, and one that employers need to take very seriously. And I think you've, you've got a case study for us here, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. So in this case study, we're looking at Stephen, who's a junior accountant. He's been working from home throughout the pandemic. Um, he lives in a small flat with his partner and colleagues have, have commented that recently he's becoming increasingly withdrawn and, and anxious. It sounds like it's, it's quite a familiar problem. I'm sure many people have sort of come across something similar. So what practically can LL do, LLA do in this situation? Yeah, so so we know that LLA have been told that Stephen's struggling, so they have the perfect reason to instigate a conversation with him. So in the first instance, they should speak to him, um, ask him some probing questions, but obviously in a sensitive way about, about how he is, how's he feeling? Um, is there anything he can point to that's affecting him and making him feel this way? Um, it might be that his work or personal life or a combination of the two is, is, is really affecting him. Um, and it's very likely in this scenario that the pandemic is going to be a factor, possibly having no distinction between his office and his living space at home, which can obviously in turn lead to feeling like, like you can't switch off. Um, LLA should also explore what more they can do to support Stephen. Um, and of course, it should be borne in mind that mental health conditions can constitute disabilities if, if the condition is sufficiently serious and long term, in which case there may be the duty to, to make reasonable adjustments for him. Um, but another thing for me is that LLA should be thinking about how well they are communicating with Stephen. Are there regular catch up scheduled with him? Does he know what the expectations of him are? Um, he might not know how much he's expected to work, what support is available. You know, he's not seeing his peers, he's not seeing his line managers and he's not having that face to face contact. So it's really important to establish the boundaries where employees are working from home, particularly where, where junior employees are concerned and, and putting into place regular meetings and catch-ups will, will provide LLA with that, the means of addressing that with Stephen. Um, and even though we're moving towards some form of normality, we don't know how long, 
campaign working will continue for. Um, indeed, it's likely to continue indefinite, indefinitely in, in some form or other if the current appetite for home working continues. So it's really important that employers get this right and keep those lines of communication going. And in addition to the communication, is there anything else that they can be doing from a well-being perspective? Yeah, I think I think there's a number of, of quite simple things really. Um, they can encourage Stephen to take exercise, tell him not to work over his lunch break. Um, they could be organising weekly chat groups with colleagues, he's setting up exercise challenges, virtual and, and hopefully soon face-to-face -face social events. Um, and all these things sound simple and maybe a bit bit obvious, but knowing that your employer endorses that you should be looking after yourself and that you're being encouraged to interact with your colleagues on a social level, it's a means of showing that that the employer cares and, and it's a way of injecting balance into the working relationship, which might well have been lost during the course of the pandemic. Um, and obviously, if LLA have any other wellbeing resources and benefits that they can offer and make available to Stephen, this might help support his mental health. You know, some employers offer confidential helplines um, to discuss mental health and, and, and access to free mindfulness apps, wellbeing training. All of these types of things help to build that culture that employees are valued and, and, and feel cared for. And you mentioned cult culture there. It, it sounds as though the culture of the workplace plays a real part in that. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, it's it's the most important thing from a well-being perspective in the workplace. Is, is there a culture of openly talking about mental health and well-being? Um, in this scenario, we know Stephen's colleagues have commented on his well-being, so there may already be that culture in place of talking openly about mental health. Um, but the key point is until organisations have cultures of, of, of open conversations about mental health and, and people genuinely believe that they won't be judged for talking about their own health, mental health issues, it doesn't matter how many wellbeing resources or initiatives are in place to support mental health, people won't take up the offer until they, and, and you know, and they're not going to feel it engaged until they feel that they can speak openly about their mental health issues. And I know this is a really difficult question, but if an employer feels like they haven't got that type of culture at the moment, what can they do to, to go about bringing that change? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really hard question, um, but in my mind, it's, it's starting the conversation from the top down. So senior leaders showing vulnerability, providing training and, and asking how people are and really meaning it. Um, I mean, the key point here is the, the perception of the workforce. That's what matters. It's not the, the senior leader's perception of what the culture is. So unless you, cl you crack that, then there's little chance of be becoming an, an employer of choice, you know, an employer that, that employees choose to work for. So for me, it's starting that dialogue around well-being and mental health and then, and then backing, up, back, backing that up with support and benefits. I think that takes us on to yeah, the next part of the case study. So um, we now know that S Stephen is claiming that LLA owe him legal obligations because of the, the negative impact that, that remote working is, is having on his mental health. And, and is that right? Do they owe him legal obligations? Well, it, you know, it's been, in short, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a tricky balancing act over the course of the pandemic for employers. They've had to make quick business decisions on the one hand and then quick decisions about employees' safety and well-being on the other. Um, but what's interesting is the, the law hasn't actually changed. So in general terms, LLA owe him the same duties as they always owed every employee, and, and that's to take steps that are reasonably necessary to ensure Stephen's health, safety and welfare. And this duty extends to employees who work from home, so employers should carry out risk assessments for those working from home as far as they possibly can. Um, in Stephen's case, this would ensure that as a junior employee, he was adequately supervised and regular contact was made to ensure that he was healthy and safe. Um, and both ACAS and the, the Health and Safety Executive have issued guidance on this, which we can make available after the seminar for those who are interested. And it sounds as though, you know, it's it's his kind of home working that might be contributing a lot to, to the way that he's feeling. If he wanted to return to the office, is that something that he would be able to do? Yeah, I think it, it doesn't appear to be an alternative solution. 
then LLA do need to consider whether a request to return to the workplace can be accommodated. Um, so the latest government guidance is that office workers should continue to work from home if they can, and that's until the 21st of June, unless it's not possible because of mental or physical health difficulties or if there's a particularly challenging home working environment. So this section could potentially apply um, to Stephen, um, but when considering that, LLA need to think about whether they are under a, a legal duty. So is Stephen suffering from a disability? And if so, is it reasonable? Is it a reasonable adjustment to allow him to return to, to the workplace? Obviously, the duty only applies where the disability is, uh, where there is a disability and, and mental health conditions can constitute such. Um, where there's no specific legal duty, so if Stephen's unlikely to, to, to be disabled, then they need to consider the, whether the request would protect Stephen's welfare under normal sort of health and safety obligations and then weigh that risk to Stephen of remaining at home against the risk of him attending the workplace and obviously in the workplace he's, he's undoubtedly at a higher risk of, of contracting COVID so there's that factor there. And are there any other factors that they need to consider? So when when doing this sort of risk assessment, they need to think about the seriousness seriousness of, of of Stephen's mental health condition. Obviously, the more serious it is, the greater the need for him to return to work, most likely. Um, also, need to think about whether Stephen is at serious risk of harm if he's not permitted to attend the office. Again, that's going to swing the balance towards his return to work. And then you also need to look at whether a safe place of work can be provided. Is LLA COVID safe? Have risk assessments been completed? All those sorts of things. Um, so it's very much a weighing up exercise. But one point to mention is that if anyone is conducting a, a risk assessment of this nature, it's really important that it's documented well so that there's the evidence there to justify any decision should it ever be challenged. And so what should employers be thinking about as we move out of lockdown? So sort of picked out four top tips um, when thinking about mental health and well-being, sort of drawing on what we covered today. Um, the first is devising a strategy for communication for communicating with employees about mental health. So returning to the workplace, it's going to conjure up different emotions for employees. Some will welcome it. For others, the thought of returning to work might have a significant impact on their mental health. So it's really important to think about devising a supportive strategy to communicate with employees and, and to really think about the individual needs of employees when doing so. So it may, might be a good opportunity for senior leaders to show some vulnerability and connect with the workforce um, when commu communicating that return to work piece. Um, the second point is around making it clear to employees how they will be supported if they do raise mental health issues. Because um, by making employees aware that their mental health needs will be taken seriously will go a long way towards helping create that culture that I was talking about earlier, about speaking openly about mental health. Um, the third point is um, around getting your workforce to complete mental health risk assessments, which is a relatively new thing, but it, it's a practical way of understanding mental health challenges faced by your, your particular business. And it's also a means of starting that dialogue around mental health. So these risk assessments enable employers to ask individuals what their problems are, but not in an, in an invasive way so they can be anonymized and the data can be used to then drive initiatives within the workplace and again giving senior leaders an insight to the mood of the organization and and the issues that might be affecting employees um, and the final point i just wanted to mention was um, again a relatively relatively new uh, and practical way of, of supporting mental health in the workplace and that's for employers to train employees to become mental health first aiders um, so this is done by a two-day course it's run by mental health first aid england and employees are giving given in-depth understanding of, of mental health and practical training on spotting triggers and signs of mental health and issues so this in turn means that they can help with mental health initiatives within the workplace and can be a really useful support for HR as well. So yeah, they're, they're my four, four top tips there. Um, so 
now we're just turning to our first poll of the, the webinar. Um, as Lucy mentioned, we've got three in total. Please could you vote yes or no to the following question? Um, have any of you seen a rise in employees raising mental health concerns during the pandemic? Got 30 seconds to vote. Um, and just to mention that you have to vote and then click the submit button at the bottom. Through now. It's going to be interesting to see what the results are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If it supports what we, we're thinking at the moment. So, yeah, so the, the results are in. So, 63% said they'd seen a rise in employees raising mental health concerns during the pandemic. Only 6% said no, um, and 31% didn't answer. So, so you know, a significant number of you have seen an increase in that, which supports everything that we're saying here today. Absolutely. I think it just uh, shows how important kind of mental health is for employers. It's kind of like okay, it's so many of you are experiencing this kind of day to day at work. Uh, obviously, kind of Lucy is going to be covering our next topic, which is the other huge area of change that we've seen over the past year and that kind of shift towards flexible working. Yeah, thanks, Alice. We've seen a lot in the press recently um, with various employers announcing kind of hybrid working patterns going forwards. Examples of that are nationwide saying they're happy for employees to work anywhere. BP potentially saying that employees can work two days a week from home. Um, we're going to be returning to our uh, case study scenario shortly. Um, obviously, the current advice at the moment is that where people can work from home, they should still uh, continue to do that. Um, and with that in mind, LLA um, themselves haven't actually yet made any announcement about their expectations um, about people returning to the office. However, um, at least three of their employees are wanting some certainty about their future working patterns and they've actually gone to the, the length at the moment of making formal flexible working requests in order to uh, try to pin down what's going to be happening. So we've got three employees here. We've got, um, they're all senior accountants. We've got Barbara um, who wants to do a shorter day, nine till three, with two days a week in the office, three days from home. Amanda wants to work five days a week from home, doing a slightly later working day, 10 a.m. to 6.30. And we've got Colin, who wants to work a more traditional day, um, but with three days uh, a week from home. And he wants to use his uh, lunch hour later on in the day to pick his children up from school. So obviously, um, LLA are going to have to evaluate these requests and there's going to be some pros and cons for them to consider. Thinking first of all about the positives, um, if they were to go ahead and accept these applications. Um, generally, if you know, you're taking on board requests from your employees, you're likely to have uh, much happier, more productive, more loyal employees because they feel like their, their needs are being listened to and taken into account. It might help with recognising the diversity of your workforce because you might actually be helping acknowledge some of the difficulties that they may have with things like childcare commitments um, or equally maybe aiding uh, their mental and physical health by uh, putting in place some of these changes. From a, a practical point of view, having fewer people in the office at any one time can have two real benefits. One is in terms of giving comfort to employees that are returning to the workplace that it's going to be easier to maintain social distancing. We're not quite sure as yet how long social distancing is going to need to be in place. And equally, we don't know whether LLA have got any financial aims in the future to potentially reduce some of their office space. Um, again, not having everyone in at the same time might help them to achieve that aim. Looking at it from a very individual perspective, it could well be that these working patterns work better um, in relation to the, the duties that these individuals perform. So Amanda, for example, they're asking to work that kind of later working day. If she works with different time zones, maybe she does a lot of work with the US, that might actually help to um, make her working life a bit easier. 
and help with those elements. Turning to have a look at the, the perhaps the negatives in accepting all of the requests, one of the first very practical issues that you would see is that if all of the requests were accepted, there wouldn't be one day of the week where everybody is in the office. Now, that might not be a problem, but equally for LLA, they might have a need to have um, those senior accountants all attending one meeting on at least one day a week, or maybe one day a fortnight. That would be something to consider. It would be really important for LLA to consider here whether they've got the technology to support home working. We've all managed and coped for the past year, but that doesn't mean that necessarily by design, um, a, a lot of the systems that we use might have been what, what would have been chosen. So it's a real opportunity there to have a look at the technology and look at the policies and procedures that support that technology. So with employees working more from home, it's going to be really important to refresh things like IT and data protection policies. How is that technology going to support things like quasi virtual meetings, maybe some people in the office and some people from home? And I think it's really important in this situation for LLA to consider really how the supervision and reporting is going to work. You've got senior accountants here who may well be responsible for supervising and managing juniors. Um, and obviously we had the situation with Stephen in the first case study. Um, how is that actually going to work remotely? Again, we've kind of managed for the past year, but going forwards, um, we kind of need to look more closely at how that will work in practice. So there's obviously a number of points there that LLA are going to have to consider in, in reaching their decision. There's also kind of another factor which has affected a lot of people over the pandemic, and that's obviously childcare. With kind of schools closed, there's been a lot of people juggling home working um, and homeschooling, and obviously there's been kind of children around a lot more. Now obviously schools are going back and everything's opening up. Kind of what should be the approach to kind of childcare? Like Colin has obviously referred to picking up his kids from school in his application. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it may well be that that kind of idea of using his lunch hour to collect the children works well and, and LLA might be quite happy with that. But I think they should feel reassured that it's still appropriate for an employer to have those conversations with employees about what their child care um, arrangements are. So, like you say, Alice, you know, a number of us, myself included, have, have coped with working and having children at home at the same time but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be appropriate or suitable going forward so I think employers should really feel reassured that they can still ask those questions and expect him to have childcare in place you know during his working hours. So then kind of going back to the LLA now they've kind of thought through how they want to respond what what is the kind of process that they should follow to put these their decisions into place? Yeah, so because these have been raised as, as formal flexible working requests, there is actually a formal process to follow and many of the people attending the webinar will be familiar with that. So if the request isn't going to be accepted from the outset, um, there's a process which involves meeting with the employee to discuss the request, issuing a decision in writing and then potentially dealing with an appeal if the request has been rejected. And in order to reject a request, an employer has to rely on one or more of eight statutory grounds. Um, and the thing that I think I'd, I'd really sort of bring to the attention um, of people on the call today is lockdown might have changed our ability to some extent to rely on those statutory grounds. So um, I know, you know, typically employers would rely on reasons such as detrimental impact on quality or performance previously when they've been rejecting home working requests. But actually, if the evidence shows that during lockdown, you know, performance and quality weren't impacted, it's going to be hard for employers to, to justify those reasons to reject a request going forwards. Similarly, another one that's often relied upon is the inability to recruit staff to work during the periods of time that employees are proposing not to work. And again, you know, with the current recruitment position, it might be hard to, to justify that. So obviously in our case study, LLA hadn't made an announcement and kind of employees led with their requests first. But kind of what are some practical ways that LLA could have helped manage that process better? Yeah, so I think the key here is, is really to take the initiative. So they didn't really need to get drawn into this formal process. And actually, it could be quite time consuming. You know, there could be a number of different competing requests they have to deal with. It's quite possible for employers and to take the charge here and, and to really start to communicate with employees um, as we move out of lockdown about what the future is going to look like. 
it's quite possible to make changes to working patterns through informal consultation and communication with employees. Um, and that's what we would really encourage um, employers to do, to not get drawn into this formal process that they don't need to get drawn into. So moving away from our case study, kind of what are your top tips and kind of takeaways for people in how to manage this process? Yeah, so the, the first step is absolutely that, which is to basically, you know, survey staff, find out what they are hoping for as we move out of lockdown. It doesn't mean that employers have to accept what the results of a survey say. It, it's there to basically inform um, and, and educate employers about what people might want if it's available to them. It's then really about taking the initiative and starting that communication. As I said, many employers have started to do it already. Um, but if not, now is, the, is really the time to do it. It's a great opportunity to consider the diversity of your workforce. Think about actually, can we work in a different way that is going to get the best out of each individual employee? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it's a really good opportunity here to put in place some new um, uh, you know, measures to help managers manage remotely. Um, in the new virtual world. So looking at how they will go about managing and supervising employees. I mentioned technology. As I said, this is really an opportunity where employers need to be looking at refreshing policies like IT and data protection, just to make sure that they're covered on those with the greater increase in people working from home. Everything was obviously done at rather emergency speed um, during lockdown. So now is the, the time to really go back and make sure we're, we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, trial periods, you know, there is no need for any of these arrangements that employers are talking to employees about to be uh, permanent in nature. Um, it's quite possible to have these as a trial of maybe three to six months and to basically reevaluate the situation thereafter. Some employers are being really innovative about this as well. And I've seen some employers who are looking at potentially moving to different reward structures. So rather than necessarily um, rewarding employees by reference to the number of hours that they work, it's actually looking at their output instead. So really moving away um, from, from those traditional uh, remuneration patterns. So um, I'd really like uh, to do another vote here. It would be really interesting to see um, how many people either have or are proposing to make an announcement about flexible working as we move out of lockdown. So again, you should see on the right hand side of your screen, the poll has popped up. If you could either answer yes or no, and then click the submit button, um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, as I said, it's, it's really interesting for us to uh, understand um, obviously where everybody is at in this process. So I'll just give it a little bit longer for those results to hopefully come through. There we go, that's great. So we can see there that, uh, let's just have a look. So 54% uh, either have or will be making uh, an announcement um, and we've had so 38 percent no answer I, I would really encourage people um, if you don't want to get bogged down in flexible working requests just to, to really kind of um, start that communication with employees if you if you're not proposing uh, to look at hybrid working it's, it's good to get that communication started so, so Alice I think you're going to talk to us now about how we retain and motivate our employees Yes, so I get a fantastic positive section of looking at kind of benefit structures and how we can help people. So obviously, as we mentioned frequently, last year has been full of so many challenges. It's been kind of going breakneck speed for everybody in managing these changes. So now is a fantastic time to kind of take stock and have a look at your benefits packages that you're offering and see if they you know, still fit for purpose for the kind of the new ways that we're working and if they're still kind of working to meet those objectives of recruiting, retaining and kind of motivating your employees. So, so employers might already think that they pro provide enough in the way of benefits. What's the case for updating employee benefits? So I think there are lots of really good reasons to kind of take a look now and see what people are offering. And the first one is to you know, still be an employer of choice. You, know, you want to attract and retain the best people. Uh, there's a study from EBRI recently found that 78% of job applicants saw the benefits package as either 
very important or extremely important into whether they accepted or refused a job offer especially at the moment where a lot of people are maybe reluctant to move jobs they still feel a bit uncertain about kind of making those steps kind of having a really positive benefits package is a real way to attract those best people to come kind of apply for the roles that you need to fill obviously then not just for new people but for your existing people as well a good benefits package is one of the best ways to show people they're valued and supported in their roles uh, there's recently a study for Wills Tower and Watson. They said that 75% you know, of employees chose to stay in their role because they valued the benefits that were offered. It can also, uh, in your benefits package, you can show a commitment to change. So obviously, a lot of businesses are genuinely fully supporting kind of big initiatives, kind of initiatives to go green. This week, again, we're seeing lots of kind of businesses speaking out about kind of mental health awareness week kind of businesses really are taking a stance and being outspoken on kind of public issues so it's a really kind of your benefits are a real way to kind of show that that's not just you know a social media slogan it's real action that kind of really does affect your employees uh, like this week we've seen kind of people like channel four and monzo who have put into place uh, pregnancy loss benefits and support packages to kind of help people in that situation you know it can be a real positive way to show that there's meaningful commitment to these things kind of feeding into that again if you make kind of big commitments particularly maybe say like a green initiative commitment as a business to kind of become more sustainable and eco-friendly the benefits are another way you can help kind of align those objectives between kind of employers and employees and kind of help make those changes both kind of within the workforce within kind of working hours and then also feeding back into people's home lives as well you know kind of as we all know stress just doesn't stop at work and so kind of having those packages in place to help people in and out of work can be a huge way to align those employer values and third sort of fourthly it's sort of all of this meshes together to kind of create this positive workforce culture again laura is talking about this in her section you know how do you create this culture benefits are one way to really support that culture you know they show people their values they cared cared about it creates that goodwill and obviously people who are well supported and who have access to help and support when they need it are less likely to be present when they're not well and not sort of fit for work you're likely to get kind of lower and shorter sickness absence and kind of people who are more engaged and motivated while they're working that's great really interesting so so once you've thought about and identified which benefits you want to introduce how do you go about then making that change so I think for me, there's sort of two stages. So the first part is kind of your, your homework. So have a look at what you offer kind of you know, for everybody. Benefits can often be put into place in quite a piecemeal fashion. So, you know, pull everything out. What's your current offering? What, kind of what is everything? And are people aware of everything that you're currently offering? Kind of to have a look, assess your benefits package. You know, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the potential gaps? You know, a lot of people put in loads of mental health support kind of over COVID, you know, but how does that kind of now meet people's needs kind of now we're coming back to work? Kind of once you've done this you can you can look at the opportunities you can again think about your employer objectives you know do you want to put more green initiatives in you know, is there enough for mental health so you can kind of find those gaps and see what what you can do to improve them uh, then what i'd always recommend to do as i said is engage with your employees engage with your workforce speak to people get ideas get feedback you know if you have employee forums councils if you know if any union engagement things like that you know, do speak to people see what people need it might be that you know you offer and a fantastic private medical insurance package but actually when you speak to people they go or their day-to-day -day issues are they can't ever get to the gp and the dentist is really hard to kind of get in their area so what would actually might help more is switching to a health cash plan where people can opt into kind of benefits that particularly meet their own needs you can kind of tailor it to those kind of people themselves kind of once you've got your got your kind of outline you can kind of create that business case obviously look at what new benefits you can put in benefits maybe that can switch out kind of look at the potential financial impacts so you can kind of create that really robust business case for making these changes and are you able to talk us through the difference between making non-contractual and um, contractual changes to benefits yes of course so obviously if you're putting into place just brand new benefits they're just completely kind of you're starting from scratch well that's kind of nice and easy uh, you can just kind of issue them inform your workforce kind of let people know how to participate if you are kind of implementing a contractual benefit you might need a contractual change so just getting people to kind of sign and accept the kind of the terms attached to those benefits you know particularly important if you're implementing kind of a high value benefit things like you know maybe a green company car scheme if you're looking at changing benefits or sort of removing existing benefits to maybe make way for new benefits there's kind of two things to consider and that's obviously first is your benefit contractual or non-contractual 
For non-contractual benefits, typically these are your smaller benefits, sort of things like free fruit Fridays, giving people usable cups, perk box, those kind of kind of smaller benefits. And with these, you have a lot more scope to make changes. So there aren't any formal legal requirements to kind of make changes. You can just sort of change them at will. Obviously, from an employee relations side, you know, these are often still benefits that people value and that matter to your employees. So it's still worth kind of putting in a bit of time and engagement and kind of informing people about changes that you're making. For kind of your next rung up of benefits, your kind of bigger contractual benefits. These are things like your private medical insurance and company cars. Uh, there are legal processes that you have to follow. So first step is kind of, you know, take a look in your contracts. You know, do you have a contractual right to vary these benefits within your contract? If you do, often you can you can rely on those to kind of make some of those changes. If you don't have the contractual right to vary, then you will need kind of employee consent to kind of change or amend or remove these benefits. And again, depending on the changes you're making, that may be kind of easier or harder. And it can often become an employee relations point about how you engage with your workforce about these changes, about how you message with people, kind of taking into account some sort of consulting with people and talking to them and getting feedback. Potentially, though, know, if you're saying you're taking away a, sort of one scheme but replacing with a new, it can just be about encouraging people of the positive kind of steps of this change and then kind of eventually ending with that kind of signed formal variation to their contract that you can kind of keep. You can always kind of unilaterally impose a uh, contract change, but we kind of advise against that as that um, can come with a risk of claims, especially if the kind of change benefit is kind of less advantageous or kind of not as generous to the employee as the old version. So do be very careful if you're kind of making those contractual benefit changes without that kind of employee consent. That's great. So um, we're moving on to talk about green benefits now that they sound very interesting. What are they and, and, and why would employers look to introduce them? So I think green benefits are fascinating. I think it's a real kind of bit of a hot topic. It's a real kind of trend that's coming through and it's a real time to kind of take a look at these. So green benefits, a bit kind of as it says on the tin, they're green benefits, they're eco-friendly benefits, sustainable benefits, you know, ways that you can make your business more environmentally friendly. And they do matter. They are very important. Obviously, as we've mentioned earlier, a lot of employers have made kind of big commitments to these changes. You've seen people like Sky promising to be carbon neutral. Um, you know, O2 did a study as well uh, for workers. And it's also an issue that's very important to employees. 50% uh, of workers in the study said they were worried about the environmental impact of their work. And from a recent government study, 84% of people are worried about climate change. So green initiatives, they have matter from, from all angles kind of employers, employees, and also often customers and consumers and clients, they're kind of a really important area. So there are loads of ways, luckily, that you can implement green benefits or kind of improve your benefits to make them more green. And one of the first ones, and a super, super simple one, and often a very kind of cost effective one to put into place, is just signposting and providing information to employees. We're all time poor, you know, we're all very busy. Having just those kind of collated resources and easy to access information of how we can become more green and eco-friendly can be a really big benefit to employees and really encourage employees to kind of make those shifts in their habits to become more eco-friendly. Uh, another really big one again is how you can make your existing benefits and policies more green. Uh, car sort of policies and company car schemes might not sound like the greenest issue but you know does your car schemes support kind of electric vehicles you know do you have do you offer company cars that are kind of electric or hybrid and again kind of do you have electric charging points at work so you know people can use green cars when they're coming into the office next big one is kind of harnessing corporate buying power obviously as a company you have much bigger leverage to negotiate than individual people do so you can use that power you can use that kind of that leverage to do things that can benefit your employees such as going to renewable energy companies and getting sort of fixed tariffs on kind of beneficial rates that you can pass down to your employees and have as an employee benefit to kind of help them be more green. Next, you've got kind of encouraging sustainable kind of home working and travel. Obviously, home working can already be a fantastic green benefit. It can be a really good way to go green. You're cutting out people's commutes. You're enabling people to live and work locally, which we all know has kind of some fantastic green benefits for everybody. You can also look at encouraging people to have eco-friendly commutes. So again, kind of really advertising and pushing things like season ticket loans, uh, kind of cycle to work schemes, kind of again, your electric kind of vehicle schemes to kind of enable people to make their commute uh, as green as possible. And the final one I'm just going to talk through is access to green opportunities. And 
businesses again often have access to kind of loans and schemes that maybe aren't available to individuals but the business can pass down so sort of different kind of government grants and subsidies to help people there's also kind of eco-friendly investing I recently saw a fantastic scheme uh, in west yorkshire where through their kind of employers employees could invest in local eco-friendly businesses to encourage both their kind of local growth in the community and then hopefully get the profits back when uh, those businesses hopefully succeed and the final one is kind of again access to green opportunities for your employees through kind of offering things that maybe employees can't do for themselves such as upfront kind of grants uh, or sort of salary sacrifice schemes or sort of zero percent kind of loans so employees can do things like get better insulation solar paneling kind of new boilers all those eco-friendly benefits that maybe have a high upfront cost that are prohibitive to employees by themselves so that is a real whistle stop tour through green benefits that we have canted through uh, so last poll of the session and just a nice quick one uh, how many of you are planning to update your benefits kind of in the sort of upcoming year and as before it's just a nice easy uh, yes no question uh, if you just kind of select your answer and click submit at the bottom and then we're about to get to see our results hopefully we've given you some uh, some inspiration to kind of think about this uh, afterwards that's uh, one of our big takeaways for this so hopefully uh, it's uh, something something fun and positive to think about after a year of a lot of challenges <laughs> so we hopefully should nearly have our poll results so kind of about that's a, yeah kind of a bit over a third of you are kind of looking to kind of update your benefits so i think that's a hopefully a, a good number to kind of keep this moving forward so that's my section wrapped up and i think uh lucy while i've been nattering away has been looking at the q a questions so i think let's try and uh, see what we can answer yes thank you everyone we've had some really great questions submitted so thank you for that and um, the first one um that we've, we've had through we're going to have a look at now is a, a question about flexible working um i think this will be familiar to a lot of people uh, someone's asked we have people who have performed brilliantly during lockdown um, but also those who haven't been putting the hours in managers now want everybody to be back in the office full time as a result um, and i suspect that there's many people having similar conversations in their businesses i think it's really important where you're faced with this type of, of situation to think about whether actually there could be genuinely good reasons why the performance may have been poor throughout lockdown working from home it could easily be that employees have had children at home or that as zora was pointing out there have been mental or perhaps even physical uh, health difficulties um so obviously the first point of call is to try to work out whether those could be a factor secondly i think it's tempting to try to sort of steer away and avoid uh, difficult conversations um but that could actually be more damaging in the longer term and it's probably uh, you know, it's, it's fair to say that it's it's wrong to sort of tar everybody with the, the same brush just because some employees might not be performing so well. The reason I say it could be more damaging in the longer term is because actually what you're at risk of um, if you kind of go to the lo lowest common denominator is actually losing your best staff because if they're not getting the flexibility uh, that they think they should be getting uh, with you, they're probably likely to just look elsewhere now that more and more office uh, um, employers are offering hybrid working or will be doing in the near future so I, I think it's one that actually needs to be tackled on an individual basis of looking at the, at the particular individuals and why they're not performing rather than having a kind of blanket ban on on home and hybrid working um, so another great question that we've had um, is, is one for you Alice on benefits and um, somebody has said that they want to reduce their office footprint and move to more people working from home um, but that would mean losing their their office gym they'd like to offer an alternative of a contribution to um, obviously a, a sort of private gym membership can they make that swap or would they need to consult on that no, that's I think a really interesting question and again it sort of feeds back sort of back into what we've been talking about and that you know how do people's benefits fit the way it's working and obviously if you are losing things like access to an on-site gym which is a, a great benefit for employees then people call it like I said, unlikely to be happy if that's just blanket kind of removed so it's great that kind of people are looking at replacements and kind of how to get that kind of comparable benefit now in this new structure 
So whether you can just kind of take it away or swap it out, as we mentioned, depends if it's a contractual or non-contractual benefit. If it is a contractual benefit, then you do need to follow that process. You will need to kind of get that employee consent for change. However, being kind of an on-site gym that sort of comes with an office, it's probably more likely to fall into that non-contractual camp. And so being a non-contractual benefit, it's you're more free, you have more freedom to kind of just make those changes. However, again, like we said, it's, it's still an important employee relations point to kind of even if you do have the freedom just to make those changes, to engage with the workforce, you know, to talk to people, to get kind of ideas and feedback for what they think is best. So that, and again, kind of fully messaging that, you know, we're not just removing a benefit, you know, the, the, here, here are the options, you know, this is how we're going to kind of still kind of support and keep this initiative going. So people don't feel like they've just had kind of something taken away from them, which they may have valued and kind of really used. So it's, yeah, it's one to kind of get that, get that buy-in and kind of message carefully around making that change. Brilliant. Thanks, Alice. And so I don't think we, we're coming up to time, so probably not got any time for any further questions. But if uh, we haven't been able to answer your question, we will get back to you individually on those. So in terms of next steps, what we really encourage everyone to do is, as we've said, you know, survey your staff on their working patterns, their mental health, engage in that dialogue with them. As a result of that, then create a tailored action plan for your business as to whether you're going to make changes to uh, your mental health support, your working uh, patterns and models. Um, and we'd really like to set you a challenge to audit your benefits and identify two green changes that you could make in the next six months. Um, and we'd be really interested um, if you could feed back to us if you've been able to do that and what those uh, green benefits are that you've put in place. Finally, we'd um, obviously invite you to sign up to the next webinar in our series, which is going to be held in mid-July and with further details to follow. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time this afternoon and thank you for participating in our polls and submitting questions. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.